Anyway, yeah, <laughs> give your bartenders. Okay, so our third presenter is Black Mina. Six four, long hair, blue eyes, referred to fondly by the two women in his life, his mother and his girlfriend, as wow. California Sunshine, which also happens to be the name of the tattoo on his left arm. He enjoys the, <laughs> he enjoys the summer sun, quantum computing, and the simple joys of life. Swing dance and singing in the shower. You will often find him in his lab, pondering his own relevance in the universe. And in the meantime, he is building an artificial world from artificial atoms in order to solve intractable problems. And all of this is done before dinner. So without further ado, Slacko. Yeah. I will not use the microphone. So if you guys just bear with me for just a second, I'm going to do two checks before I begin. One, can you see me? Yes. No. <laughs> You're blind, my friend. And two, and two, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Then we can begin. Good. Hello. My name is Lakuminov, and I have returned to meantime to bring you a recipe. A home brewed, a local flavor, a Yale recipe on how to build artificial atoms. But these are not artificial atoms for making beer, tea, coffee, I don't know what else. These are artificial atoms for solving problems. For example, imagine this vile, vicious, voracious creature is attacking your bloodstream. <laughs> what is the chemically stable compound which will obliterate it? Well, I don't know, but I know it's an incredibly difficult problem that actually would take longer than the age of the universe to compute, and hence this problem is called impossible. But might I ask, well, why is it impossible? What is it that constrains us from solving such difficult problems? It is the laws, the laws of our world. It is the laws of our world which are set up by the building blocks, the atoms. But imagine for just a second, that we can take those laws and we could literally just scrap the laws of our world and design another world, a world in which that problem, those impossible problems, are no longer impossible, but they're easy. What we could do is we could take our impossible problem, step into another world where it is easy to solve, solve it, and then step back into our world, look at happy answers. <laughs> and what might that world be? I think it is the quantum world, the world of quantum mechanics. And how do we access quantum mechanics traditionally? It is through atoms. Atoms are quantum. But in fact, there is a small problem. We can't just use them to build this artificial world, to step into it. Why? <coughs> The Creator only gave us 116 of them. I wish there were more, but they come as they are made, with specific properties, specific electrical properties that limit the ability of what you can do, the ability of what you can achieve. And it is a good question. How do you go about designing an artificial atom to circumvent this problem if there are only 116? And you go and ask a very smart man, last year's Nobel laureate, David Wyden. <laughs> <laughs> and ask him, how do we do it? And his answer was simple, a sea of electrons. And what do I mean by that? Well, all we need is quantum. And atoms are quantum, but so are electrons. So screw atoms, throw them out the window. All we need is electrons. But the problem is electrons are so small, we can't use one of them. In fact, we have to use a billion, a billion of them, a billion electrons. And the great thing is electrons are like fish. Quantum fish. You see, when they swim in different directions, they hit each other, and they really sort of become incoherent. They are one large, classical, macroscopic, ugly object. But if, if you can make them swim together in unison, happy in unison, then they swim coherently. Then because each of the individual quantum fishes is quantum, then the whole school of quantum fish is overall quantum. So you have a large, macroscopic, 
quantum object. But the problem is, if you have one in a billion, one in a billion that swims in the wrong direction, you're screwed. You're out the door. That's a monster that will eat your coherence and destroy your quantum state. So how do we do this? How do we actually make them love each other? I don't know if you know this, but electrons, they hate each other. They really repel. They do not like each other. So how do you make them come together? You make them dead cold. You freeze them to negative 273.15 Celsius, and they will come together because it is cold, and they will move like penguins, like a herd, together. <laughs> so far, we have said that atoms are quantum, electrons are quantum, and that's all we need. Throw the atoms out. And if we can make a coherent school of quantum fish, then we can, in fact, make, begin making an artificial atom by making it very, very, very cold. And like all fish, our quantum fish require a, a home, a place to call their own, a quantum fish aquarium. And we can build a quantum fish aquarium from the thing that traps electrons, more atoms, aluminum atoms, for example. You just throw down a bunch of aluminum atoms on a little wafer on some kind of some kind, and you create a little aquarium in which your billions of quantum fish electrons can swim around in. And so I'm just zooming into that structure here in order to show you some uh, aluminum atoms, say, in silver, and a few red atoms, oxygen, just sprinkled about in order to engineer, in order to make the kind of atoms that you want, the electrical properties of the atoms you want. You can really design any kind, any, any kind of spectrum. So what does a real quantum fish aquarium potentially look like? Well, it just looks like, it doesn't look like too much, it just looks like a little blob uh, of atoms. But you have to realize there are billions of atoms, and inside there are billions of electrons that are trapped, but they are free to move around in this, in this structure. And in fact, uh, you know, they can, when you cool them down, no longer do they hate each other, they love each other, and they can swim coherently around and mimic the electrical behavior of atoms, they can, when you make them cold and you make billions of them move together and you have to make sure that not even one of the billion goes the wrong way, then you can really be, have an artificial atom. And how do you make an artificial atom? <coughs> well, you take one atom and you put it here, you take another atom and you put it there, and you take a third atom and you put it here, you connect it, and it's called a circuit. And when you have, and you just lay down a bunch of these on a chip, and you make our artificial world with our laws that we can solve impossible, potentially impossible problems. Let me just flash a picture of the dashing, charming, the loving, lovingly, uh, loving Yaleys here that are working on this over at Becton. And so, in conclusion, <laughs> we have learned that uh, quantum, that the quantum world can can help us solve potentially possible problems, that we don't even need atoms to access quantum mechanics, we need billions of uh, quantum fishes that we can cool down to a cold temperature, make them love each other, and, and have a coherent quantum macroscopic object that can mimic the electrical behavior of, a, of an atom, of, of a real atom, an artificial atom, mind you. And so we have succeeded in creating the first steps towards an artificial world that we could go to and solve our impossible problems. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, please. On the switch, but yes, go on. <laughs> do the uh, artificial atoms, do they interact or behave in the same way as real atoms when, when they interact? Oh, with each other? Yeah. Um, effectively, yes. Because, well, effectively, yes. I mean, so you can't take them and you can't hit them. You can't do mechanical things with them because we're only mimicking the, the um, electrical behavior. Uh, but in that sense, they're, they're very much equivalent. They have, they have dipole, electrical dipole moments, magnetic dipole moments. They can exert forces on each other and so on. So it's, it's similar in a lot of ways. What kind of problems do you answer these? <laughs>
Well, you, you, so you, you, all you do is you just, well, you don't pull it down to uh, exactly zero Kelvin, you stay at about 15,000 above absolute zero. Uh, and, and that just makes all these electric, the, you know, these fishes love each other and come together. And uh, it makes everything else nice and quiet. You see, when it's hot, you know, things are agitated. You know, different electrons, they're, they don't like staying in one place for too long. They start bumping into things and making a mess. And when you make everything cold, everything stays in place. And it's, you have a nice, pristine, and quiet environment to do your experiments in. Okay. Uh, last question. Last question. Last question. What size atoms are you talking about? Are you talking about like isotopes and short ones from once above, or what kind of atoms are you talking about? Yeah, well, so there, 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 there's also artificial atoms that, uh, well, so there are 116 sort of stable elements in the periodic table. There are many more elements that are totally unstable and, and do weird things, and uh, we don't usually count those. And, of course, you're right, we can synthesize different uh, elements, but it's, it's very difficult to, to do that. It's a lot easier to sort of build a little tiny circuit and use electrons. Electrons you can do well with. You know, nuclear physics, that's very hard and, uh, and to me, scary, but... So you're, you're just really doing electrons as opposed to actual, like... <laughs> exactly. We use electrons to mimic atoms. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Let's have another round.